You guys love the Word? Are you guys reading the Word? Like, are you really in the Word? Are you just getting your U version and, like, reading the verse of the day? Like, are you in the Word? We're supposed to abide in the Word. Like, it's supposed to be our lives, you know? Like, Deuteronomy 30 says God is your life, and um, I think it's, it's Colossians 3, 4, 3, 5. Paul says Christ, who is our life. It's like, this, this is it. And if you're not abiding in the word, if you're not abiding in God, you have no life. Like, can you grasp that? You have no life. It's not that you're unpopular and you're home alone on Friday nights. It's that you literally don't have a life if you're not in God and operating by the Holy Spirit. You're not producing anything eternal. You're not producing anything transformational or life-changing. You have to be in the word. And so I'll talk to Christians in there going, man, I just, you know, I got I to gotta make some time. I just have a hard time finding time to get in the word. Or when I get to it, I don't really understand it that well. If this was your life and you really understood it, it would be priority over everything. And I'm not here trying to tongue lash you. I'm just trying to say, if you're not getting ahead, if you're not getting the breakthrough, if you're not getting the movement, maybe you haven't put in what you're supposed to. Because the Holy Spirit, John 14, 26, says he brings remembrance of all the things that Jesus said. Can he remind you of something you didn't put in? We've got to put these things in. We've got to meditate. Pastor Bill says meditating on the word means you're studying on it. You're thinking on it so much. You're mumbling it. It's coming out of your mouth. You're thinking on it so much. Are we doing that with the word? This is our life. Christ is the word. John 1 makes that really, really clear. And so we're supposed to abide in him. And it's it's funny. I think when people tell me they have a hard time understanding the word, my question isn't, are you smart enough to get it? My question is, what's your posture when you go in to read the word? Because if Christ is the word and Christ is the king of kings, you're going into the presence of the king when you open your Bible. And I'm pretty serious about doing it here. I know everybody's on their phones. I get it. That's your world, do it. You need, to, you need to open a Bible. You need to go get quiet. Because in ancient times, like if you're going to go get before a king, you didn't just pop in, right? It wasn't just a drive-by. When, hey, we we're just in the neighborhood. Like that's not how you went before the king, right? You would prepare. And, and the Bible tells us to go humbly yet boldly to the throne of grace. We go boldly because he made us right with him. He wants us there. We can go confidently that we're supposed to be there. But we go humbly because we realize who he is. And the humility aspect is whatever you say is the final verdict. I know what the circumstance looks like, and I know what I feel like, and I even know what my past experiences are, but you are the king of kings, and whatever you tell me right now, that's the final verdict. And if people went into reading the word that way, I think they would understand it. Instead of trying to put it into our intellect. You see, we grow up reading storybooks, or we go to school and we do textbooks, and we try to fit things into our intellect, and God is too big for your intellect doesn't fit there. He only fits in his word through your faith. And so the place that we've got to get is meditating on this, making this become our lives. Because you're you're a three-part being. We'll see. I wrote things on paper. We probably won't get to them. Um, God's three-part being. He made you in his image and his likeness. And that's amazing because the image is you look like him. The likeness is you can do what he does. That's crazy. That's, that, that's insane. And he's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You are body, soul, and spirit. And those three correlate. I won't break all that down. But are you your body? You can interact now. Are you your body? No, you're not your body because when you die, you're not going to just lay in the ground six feet under and wait for something, are you? You're not there. Are you the spirit? Well, you have a spirit, but weren't you live and kicking before you made your life right with God? So what that leaves you is the soul, right? Is everybody tracking so far? And so we get these verses like the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword and it's able to separate soul from spirit. Why? Because you've got to separate you from your decisions, from the, from the obedience to God. And you've got to be able to follow the spirit of God. And he says the word of God is the only thing that's going to do that because sometimes your soul can sound like really good advice. But a funny thing is things like fear can disguise itself as good advice or prudence when it's really fear. And maybe you're making decisions for your kids that seem very safe and very smart, but at the root of it, if you really started asking, it's fear. Well, you've got to separate that soul from spirit because unless you're in faith, unless you're being led by the spirit of God, you can receive nothing from him. And if you're operating by two spirits, the Bible says you're a double-minded man and you're unstable in all your ways and you should expect to receive nothing Nothing, because your faith is of go, no return, because you're not actually in faith, because you're believing another voice and God's voice. See, we have to surrender everything to him. He's a king that wants everything, which is good for us. It's good news he wants everything. 
But we've got to surrender everything to him because you've got your soul. Your, your Pastor Bill always teaches it's your, your mind and your will and your emotions, and it's, it's you, essentially, right? You've got to subject that to the will of God. And that's hard to do when your emotions are really loud. And that's hard to do whenever you've already had something happen to you, and you're going, I'm not doing that again. And God goes, I need you to go back there with a new heart. I need you to go back there with a new perspective. That's hard to do. But you've got to subject your soul to the authority of God, right? And in his word. And so this soul aspect of you wants to reign and rule. And the throne of your soul is your heart. And you'll find that your heart makes every decision for you. And if Christ is not on the throne of your heart, something else is pulling the strings in your life. And there's a lot of Christians that can say, it's no longer I who live, but Christ in me. Christ is on the throne of my heart. But there's some other Christians that can say, it's I who live and it's Christ in me. And they can go to heaven. That's the kicker about the whole thing. They have eternal life. Isn't that crazy? When you said, I make Jesus my savior, he said, boom, your spirit's alive. You are eternal. But until you say, I make Jesus the Lord of my life, your soul is not interacting with his promises. Did you catch that part? This is in your court. This is why Jesus gets to hang on the cross and say things like, it's finished. I have opened every door that you need opened. You've got to choose. And if you're not operating with the promises that Pastor Bill preaches week in and week out, maybe it's because you haven't subjected your soul to the authority of the rewarder. He wants to reward you. And sometimes it's like, I don't want to go there. I don't want to be that. Like, guts was a life save for me because I had grown up in church and I didn't like Christians. That's a hard place to be when you know you're supposed to be in church, but you really don't want to go to church, right? It was boring and it was awkward and no. And then I come to guts, Travis Peters invited me to a sub 30. Good job, Trav. So much for, I'll produce a lot of fruit so you get all the reward for it. Um, I come to a sub 30 and Pastor Bill's up there and he says, no excuse, get your job done. I had never heard a Christian talk anything like that in my life. I was like, wait a second. Like I was in the military, I played division one sports. That was my language, I understood that. And when he said, no excuses, get your job done. I was like, okay, that's interesting. And then I started seeing people that I actually would hang out with in real life, not just on Sunday mornings, people I would actually want to hang out with, living for God, and I had never seen anything like it, and I went to Bible school for like six months. I, it didn't really work out very well for us. But um, Guts Church, like, I am where I am because I got in the flow of this. Flow is, is so important. Stagnant water is never as good as running water. If you get a map of the ancient world, where do all the big civilizations spring up? Where are all the dominant cities? They're along the Euphrates. They're along the Nile. They're along the Ganges. They're, they're along rivers because flowing water produces so much more life than stagnant water. You can, you can stifle disease because you can wash regularly in a river. You can, you can have food. You can have drinking water. You can have transportation and communication with other civilizations. Like running water produces so much more than stagnant water. I mean, like if you're thirsty, would you rather like an Oklahoma pond in, the, in August, or would you write like those beer commercial streams? Like, that's, yeah, that's what you want. Running water, well, scripturally, it's the same thing. Flowing water in the Word of God is these rivers of living water. They actually have it depicted in the actual region of Israel. You've got the Jordan that flows, right? And when they crossed over the Jordan, they went from death to life, right? That flowing water was an example of death to life. You got John the Baptist going up and down the Jordan. What's he doing? Baptizing people from death to life. It was this flowing river of life. But then it goes down, and what does it run into and empty into? The Dead Sea. It gets dammed up and stops producing life. And so I'm asking Guts Church Wednesday nighters, have you received the implanted word? Have you taken the washing of the water of the word and dammed it up? Or is there a flow to it? Because when you dam up the Word of God, when you dam up the Spirit of God, because it says you can quench the Spirit, you've got that much power. If you dam up the Word of God and you dam up the Spirit of God, you're left with one of two options. You're either going to get bitter because things aren't happening and you feel like God is forsaking you, or you start entering into doubt because you don't believe this is real. But the problem is you dammed up what He's trying to flow through you. Because freely you've received, therefore freely give. That's the flow. If you've got it in your understanding, you give it. If you've got it in your finances, you give it. If you've got it in the power and the authority, you give it. That's the flow. And he says, he who I've given much, I'm going to expect much. And he who has much, I'm going to give more too. 
your faithfulness elevates you. So faithfulness is funny, too, because in the world, everything's about going up the corporate ladder, right? Going to go up. Well, in the kingdom, as you elevate, you go down. You carry more. Jesus, in Philippians 2, it says, being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So before he took on flesh, he's God, right? He's the fullness. But it said he humbled himself to that of a man, but not just a man, to that of a bondservant. So he's not just man, he's a servant to man. And then it said he came and died the death of a man, but not just the death of a man, death on a cross. Jesus came and washed feet. He said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. And so we say things like, the things that he did on this earth, we can do only greater. And yes, absolutely, like take that anthem, go do miraculous works. But the things he did on this earth, we also do. We need to wash feet. We need to take care of people. We need to not be too proud to go to the humble. And the funny thing about Jesus washing feet in there is that was the filthiest thing you could do. That was for the lowest scum in society was to wash people's feet, and Jesus did it, did it. And it was so awkward that whenever Jesus went to wash Peter's feet, he's like, Lord, you can't wash my feet. I can't have you washing my feet. And Jesus goes, if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part of me. For us, it's not our feet, it's our hearts. Because for them, everything was external and physical in the old covenant, but then Jesus transferred it to the inside of us, greater is he who's in us. And so we've got these heart issues, and Jesus goes, if you don't give me the dark, dirty places of your heart, you have no place with me. That's the throne of your soul, what you really desire, what you're passionate about. And I'm telling you, the only one worthy of the dark, dank, scary places in your heart is your Savior who loves you and died for you. He's the only one, and you've misplaced it. We all have. We've all put that trust or that need or whatever it is. We put it in the hands of a relationship or a paycheck or something that's here that we can have tangibly, and he goes, that's going to let you down. It's not going to satisfy, and we've all experienced that, haven't we? Has everybody in here been let down? Has anybody in here had your heart broken? And I mean that in multiple ways. I get my heart broken in ministry all the time, all the time. So I'll pour my life into people. Paul says, I pour myself out as a drink offering in the service of your faith. And I'm growing in God, and I'm learning that I'm pouring myself out for people's eternity, and then they'll reject it and walk away. And it hurts. It's heartbreaking. I was actually, uh, Pastor Bill and, and Dr. Robert Berenger came to Sepulpa and toured one time, and, and I was just like, I get to be with these two guys. This is crazy. And we're walking around the campus, and for no reason, I have no idea why, Dr. Robert Berenger just stopped, and he looked at me and goes, they say, <laughs> it still hits me really hard. He said, they say this, in modern psychology, it takes six to seven years to recover from a full betrayal. And he said, how often do you think Pastor Bill and I get betrayed? I said, I don't know, every week? He goes, think about that. Just like Mike chopped and walked away. I was like, it's heartbreak. And we put our heart in these places where they get betrayed. And some of it is for the world, but some of it for the kingdom. Sometimes you're going to get your heart broken for the kingdom, and that's okay. This is why when we enter in and we get before Jesus, it says he's going to wipe every tear from our eyes. Why? Because you gave everything and it hurt. You're a lamb led to slaughter. I know it's not fun, but there's a greater reward on the other side because everything that I do through you lasts forever. Anything you do of your soul and yourself is going to burn up in the day of judgment. You're wasting your time because I am your life. And so what I think, this is just AJ-isms, but... I think when we go to Jesus and we talk about handing him our crowns and all this stuff, I think we're handing him our heart. I think we're going, this is the throne. I gave you the throne of my heart on this earth. And everything that you did through that throne and through the working and the lordship of my life, he says, well done, come on in. That's your reward. That's forever. And really, it's going to be souls. Souls are the eternal peace, right? There's not really anything on this earth you're going to build that's eternal except for people's lives. That's what we got to pour ourselves into. That's the feet we got to go wash. And the Bible says if, if you humble yourself before the Lord, before his mighty right hand, he says in due time, he will exalt you. He will exalt you. Don't grow weary in doing good, for in due time, you'll receive a reward. There will be a harvest. That due time is interesting. It's interesting that harvest and reward is attached to humility. We're not chasing after things of this earth. We're chasing after the things of God. Ultimately, we're chasing after him because I don't just need the things in his right hand of power. I need his face, and then I get all of that. If I know him, if I know the promise giver, I get all the promises because he'll lead me by still waters. This flow is, is really 
really fascinating to me, the study of water. Like, stagnant water isn't good. Like, creation, Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and vo without void, and the Spirit hovered over the waters. The waters weren't moving. They weren't doing anything. The earth had no direction. But then God steps in and starts ordering it and puts it in place, and it's really cool. I'm actually going to read this. We'll get into um, what he does with Eden in, in Genesis 2. Um, let's see. He creates Adam, and he breathes life into him, and then it, like, stops for a bit, stops talking about Adam, and goes into what um, the Garden of Eden's like. In verse 10, it says, Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It's the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, and there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. <laughs> Have you ever run into gold that's not good? Okay. Um, Bedellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that goes around the whole land of Cush. The third's name is Hidekel. It's the one which goes towards the east of, Is of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. Then it goes back to Adam. It says, Adam, here's what you're supposed to do. Why did God stop for that period of time and tell us about all the things that are in the land? Because he's going, Adam, you're already resourced to do what I'm about to tell you to do. It's already there. And what's fascinating to me is, again, is this flow. This flow started at that salvation point of Eden on the earth. It is going out to the world. He told Adam, tend and keep the garden. Tend, if you study the word, means to like enslave it and to, to dominate over it. To keep it means to protect it. And so what he's saying is this culture of Eden, I'm going to flow it through these rivers and we're going to spread it around the whole earth and I need you to keep this culture. You dominate. You don't go out into the world and let the world change you. You go out in the world and change the world. And so we're going to follow these rivers because it didn't just say the rivers flowed out. It said exactly where they went, didn't it? And where these rivers went was just as important as what was there. So crazy. This is the flow of our lives. There's a verse that I love in Ecclesiastes 11.1. I'm going to have to watch the time because I just start talking and get lost. In Ecclesiastes 1, it says, Cast your grain upon the waters, and in many days you'll find it. That sounds really like just a verse you would just read past and not think too much of it. But what it's talking about here, and there's a lot of goofy translations of it. Go with this one. Just trust me. <laughs> Go with this one. Um, you cast your grain. See, your grain, you've got it in your hand, and you could do whatever you wanted with this grain. You could eat of it if you're hungry. You could start to sow it, and you could grow a harvest. But God is telling you, cast it on the waters. That's so counterintuitive. He says, cast it on the waters. So you do it. You throw it on the waters, and then you get to stand there and go, okay, now what? And now he's going to go, you're in a place of weakness, so now I can show you my perfect strength. When you cast aside the things that you think you're good at, the things you're entitled to, the things that maybe even be your spiritual giftings, and we may come back to that in just a second, when you put those on the river, the flow of my life, and you let me come through in your weakness, you're going to learn to rely on me. And it didn't stop there with cast your grain on the waters. It said you're going to go back and find that strength. Because what happens when you cast the grain on the waters? It flows down the river. It starts hitting fertile embankments. It starts producing a harvest. And as soon as you start living out your life and walking forward, you've got resource before you even get there. And, it, and now it's your strength. And so he says, you learn to trust me in your weakness. Now when I give you back your strength, it's going to be subjected to me the same way your weakness was. And we're going to keep growing the kingdom. So if you're in a position or a job or whatever you feel like, this is not what I'm good at and this is not what I'm passionate about, maybe you're just casting your grain on the water. Maybe God's trying to build something in you, a trust stance, that whenever he blesses you, you're strong enough to hold it. Because he blessed Solomon. Solomon's an amazing story. Poor Solomon. Didn't do so well. Because he thought the call of God on his life was to build the temple. That wasn't the call of God on his life. His father's David, he, he walked with the Lord, and he got the plans for the temple, and he gave them to his son. And Solomon built it in the first few years of his reign. Well, then what does he do? He just kicks his feet up, and God starts blessing it. But he didn't have the discipline because he didn't go through what his dad went through, and so the blessings crushed him. He, he ruined Israel. We've got to go through these things in our life that create the discipline and the structure that we can uphold the blessings of God and show them to the world. You don't want a blessing without discipline. It will harm you. You don't want a promotion without knowing what you're doing because you'll get there and get lost. Don't elevate too fast. This is why it says in due time. Do we go after the promises of God? Yes. Do we forsake the process? No. Go through every single step. This flow in your life. This flow in your life.
you've got to put the word in every day. You've got to put the word. It cannot be an option for your life anymore. Uh, and like Job says, I desired your word more than, than necessary food. Sometimes if things are just getting hectic in my life, I make rules for myself. I'm not going to eat till I read the word. I'm not going to go to sleep until I've prayed for a certain amount. I will, just, I will just draw lines in the sand because I know how much more I need God than I need my own answer, than I, feel, than I need what I think is the breakthrough. I need him. He's the thing that's not going to forsake me. It's funny, like, if you keep journals, your life just progresses. And if you'll read back, you're like, I totally forgot that even happened. But at the time, it was the biggest ordeal in the world. And these situations come and go, but God is the thing that's steadfast. He's the one you have to draw to. He's the one you've got to walk with every single day. Your whole life is about drawing near to him, okay? Your whole life is about recreating Christ in your heart so that you're showing it on the earth. Because it used to be in the old covenant, it was external. It was the things from the outside, the sacrifices of animals and the works of my hand and my obedience to the commandments, that's going to change my inside. But then God flips it and he says, no, now it's the inside out. What you do for my spirit and when you subject your soul to the spirit, is going to then flow out the body. It's backwards from what it used to be. And us being born in the flesh have to relearn how to let the spirit dominate because you get born again. You're born into the flesh and you learn how to operate by the flesh. You look both ways before you cross the road, right? That's how we live our lives. And then you, get, you become a Christian and you get this new God, this new king, this new authority. You've got to learn how to hear that spirit. And the only way to learn how to hear that spirit is to go spend time with him. Because we hit storms and we want to hear God's voice in the storm. He's going, if you would have heard me in the quiet first, this would be a lot easier to hear my voice. Is he going to leave you or forsake you? Absolutely not. If you call on his name, will he save you? Yes. But wouldn't you rather be prepared for that? Wouldn't you rather have a harvest in that storm instead of just getting hit and surviving? I'd rather elevate when a storm hits. You're not supposed to go around the mountains. You're not supposed to live the same Christian life for 30 years. You're not supposed to live that way. He's an elevated, eternal God. He always has more for you. He's always saying, look up. Look up. It's in Psalms 3, I think it is. It says he's the one lifter of your head. There's no other lifter of your head. There's one lifter of your head. And we start looking down and we're going, this is what I've got and this is who I am and this is the circumstance. He goes, pick your head up. Just lift your head. I've got this. The fields are wide unto harvest. Let's go. Why are we looking down dealing with this when I need you to go through it? I went to West Point for a couple years, and, and we took boxing, um, so fear me. But um, they would teach us when you're punching, you punch through them. You punch through. You don't aim for their nose. You aim for the back of their head when you're going to punch to get the most power. And I think it's the same thing in our faith. You set your expectation on the other side of that obstacle. You don't just say, it's right here. I'm going to deal with this. You're going, no, this is what my life is going to look like on the other side of this. That's expectation. That's hinging your hopes on something bigger than yourself because you could get through it on your own, but you can elevate through him. You can become a new creation through him. You can have a testimony with the blood of the lamb. And this is who we're called to be. And so I'm asking you to just start over in a sense. Subject your soul back to the spirit of God who saved you, who called you, who has a plan for you. If you're in a dire situation, great. And I know that sounds morbid, but if you're in a dire situation, guess what? You have a savior. If you're in a situation where you're going, I don't know why I'm here. When is this going to change? Am I going to get the promotion? Is anything going to shift ever? Just know that you're casting grain on the water. Stay faithful because he's faithful. Keep walking. It's a walk of faith. And if you start trying to sprint, you may trip. You'll get back up. You'll keep going. But you walk. And you hit this situation and you go. The only thing God wants you to be faithful with is your life. Stop worrying about what you see on the outside. Stop worrying about what's going on in the politics. Stop probably just going on social media, period, unless you're looking at Guts Church, because we'll tell you what to do. But stop worrying about all these external things, because we don't live outside in anymore, do we? That's old covenant. We live inside out. And I know everything's going on, and I feel pressure from everywhere, but I feel no pressure in my heart. Why would I sweat this? I know how my body feels, but I, I, I pass away outwardly, but daily I'm renewed on the inside. I'm going to live from the inside. Moses lived till he was 120. He was fresh and flourishing. Why not me? I'm renewed inside out. 
this is what we've got to drive to. And so if you say things like, I'm just dealing with depression, I'm dealing with fatigue and anxiety, if I'm dealing with worry, it's because you're taking the circumstances and you're digesting them outward in. And you're letting the outward things tell you who you are inside. Get in the word, let it renew your mind and refresh you, and start living inside out. And you go tell the world who you are. I'm hidden in Christ. I'm his kid. He chose me before the foundations of the earth were set. Everything that I need is already supplied according to his riches and glory. I'm going straight through you. And this is the life you live. And guess what amazing ministry is, is that as you walk, goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life. Like just, just like a ski boat, there's just a wake of goodness and mercy flowing. And everybody who's swept up into that is your fruit in eternity. And you get to go stand in front of Jesus and go, we're here. We did it. I live my life, and I touch so many of your children, and let's go party. Heaven's party, right? This is where the work is. Solomon said, hey, do all the work now. And, and, and uh, Ecclesiastes 10.9 says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, because when you die, there's no more wisdom, there's no more work. He said, do it now. Do it now. I don't want to stand in front of Jesus and go, I could have, should have, would have. I want to stand in front of Jesus and go, I poured everything out, because you were worth it, and this is worth it. Is everybody good? You guys are amazing. I'm telling you, don't be discouraged. We're doing a great work at Guts Church. God has an amazing plan. And when Pastor Bill, I love how Pastor Bill does revival, deliverance, and abundance because he doesn't, you'll hear pastors or preachers and they'll be like, revival's going to hit America and it's going to sweep through in Israel. And Pastor Bill goes, no, I'm going to put it in your kitchen. Revival's going to hit your house. That's different. Because I have no buy-in and I have no accountability when it's, it's going to sweep over the Middle East. I hope so. Like, I know I should pray and feel that way. But you know what I am passionate about? My marriage. I am passionate about my kids. I am passionate about what we're producing for the kingdom. And so when he says revival hits my life, I'm going, whoa, what does that look like? Okay, what do we need to do? What's been holding me down? Because now we've got deliverance. And then those goals and those dreams and those desires that God's given us, well, abundance is going to flood through because I'm going to come back to my grain that I sowed. Oh, this is good news. 2020 is going to be amazing. I hope you guys know that. I hope you know that 2020 is going to be amazing for your lives personally. The things that have held you down until now won't hold you in 2021. They're not going to. You're not going to let them because you're going to get into your soul and you're going to do what King David says and you're going to go, soul, worship the Lord. And you're going to say, soul, be quiet. That's how David talked to himself. Do it. You command the Spirit of God to rule in your life because he is king. He is king of kings, and you're a king. So you get to rule everything underneath him. He rules you. You rule everything else. Take dominion. Multiply. Tend and keep. That's you. Guys, we own this world. You know that? We own this world. There's one letter difference in the word and the world, and it's L. world's taken L's heart. Every time it's the word versus the world. That was one of the cheesier things I've said tonight. But the world is always taking the L whenever it comes up against the word. Stand on the word. I should bring this to the close. I want to go for like a half hour more. Just think about what's on those notes. We'll take it to a close here. There's um, that story of the woman who was caught in adultery. You guys know that one? And it says that the Pharisees, they set a trap for her. What a bunch of punks, right? And they weren't even setting a trap for her. They were setting a trap for Jesus. They were using her as bait. We're bait, and the enemy's trying to see if God's going to be faithful. And he's trying to trap us and ensnare us. But the good news is the Bible says that he's released us from the fowler's snare. We're free. Even if we get caught, even if we fall down, he releases us again. Stop feeling the pressure of your past. There's no regrets with God. He picked you. He doesn't unpick you, okay? So they catch this woman. They bring her before Jesus, and they're trying to hold up Jesus, and they go, Moses would say we stone her to death. That's what his law says. What are you going to do, right? The Pharisee leaned back. And Jesus goes, yeah, okay. And you guys know what he says? He without sin cast the first stone. Go for it. And he starts getting down and writing in the sand. I won't tell you what I think about that, but... Everybody leaves, right? Because they have sin. And the only one who doesn't have sin gets to stay there, who's Jesus, right? Could Jesus have thrown a stone at her? Yeah, he didn't have sin. He could have held up the law of Moses. But he goes, daughter, because now he's the father, right? Daughter, where are your accusers? She goes, they're not here. He goes, I don't accuse you either. And then he says something crazy that sounds impossible. He says, go and sin no more. 
why could she go and sin no more now? Because the reason she was sleeping around is because she needed a man to protect and provide for her. If you were a woman in that society, you had to have a man. She was trying to find one. And she just came into contact with her father, who's going to provide and protect her. And now he goes, you don't need them anymore. You've got me. Go and sin no more. It wasn't a condemnation to go be self-righteous and try to live morality. He says, you don't have to sin anymore. You're free. You're free.